from their conception to their announcement to their release, video games go through countless changes during development. Just like any piece of media, every game goes through tons of work before becoming what we know them as today. You have to pitch the game, create a mountain of concept art, make the alpha, beta, prototype builds, and even after a game's release, it might still see some slight revisions. Game development has always been a fascinating topic to many, and that's likely because when games are first shown off, they're often very different from how they look when they're released. Thanks to early trailers, press releases, and even demos, we get a rare glimpse at early stages of a game's development. Today, I'd like to go through some notable examples of early builds of some of our favorite games. May they be betas, prototypes, or even cancelled releases. Most of the time, especially for older games, the only way we got to see anything from these early versions were from magazines or events. Because of it being so limited, many of these have since been lost to time. However, sometimes, early builds do get leaked, and sometimes even released officially, and that's always incredibly exciting. You never know where one of these will turn up. Take this Super Mario Bros. 2 prototype that was found in the garage sale. Now that's the dream. It's always a miracle when any of these are archived, no matter the game. Not every company keeps great backups of their unfinished work, and even those that do, nothing's pushing them to release any of this. All of this makes prototypes or unfinished builds of games in general extremely interesting. So, let's talk about it. This is a look at some of the most interesting video game prototypes that change during development. Let's begin! When it comes to the first game of a franchise, that's where a lot of early concepts and ideas can be found. Before you begin developing the first game in a series, you need to completely design its world and everything that brings. Thankfully for most popular characters out there, their development is well documented given its historical nature. We know a lot about Sonic the Hedgehog's creation, but in terms of Sonic 1's actual development, a good deal of it is still shrouded in mystery. The Sonic the Hedgehog franchise was shown off publicly for the first time ever at the 1990 Tokyo Toy Show, which was held that year from June 7th through the 10th in Japan. At the event, there was a playable demo of what would become Sonic 1. These are screenshots of what was the world's first ever glimpse at Sonic the Hedgehog, and as you can immediately tell, it looks totally different than the final game. This demo was made right at the beginning of the game's development, a year out from when it would release in North America. This was a small-scale tech demo, put together by Sonic Team for the event to promote the game. But tragically, this hugely important, fascinating moment in the series' history is almost completely undocumented. This is an unfortunate trend with early game builds. Documentation for a lot of them is generally pretty poor. It makes sense, why would a company keep all these unfinished builds once the game is finished? The final product is what's going to be sold. Who's to say there will be anyone interested in these unfinished revisions? When a game becomes iconic though, people will want to know everything there is to know about it. But unfortunately with cases like Sonic 1, it seems like that just isn't possible. Outside of these screenshots, we have next to nothing from this demo. Now, you might be thinking, well, why doesn't Sega just release it? Surely they still have backups of it, right? For years, it was unknown if these screenshots even came from a playable demo. It looked so radically different from any other build of the game. But, in an interview done by Games Radar at Summer of Sonic 2011, Yuji Naka confirmed that Sonic Team produced a playable demo for Tokyo Toy Show 1990. He stated, In 1990, the team created a demo for a toy show. There was no Tokyo Game Show, so the major show to go to at the time was this toy show. So they used this as a playable demo to show what Sonic would be like, and to show the breakneck speed that Sonic has. This actually has got seven layers of background scrolling. A lot of effort went into creating it. But along with confirming it, he's also said that he's made efforts to locate the demo, but has never been successful. In that same interview, he adds, When we created Sonic Mega Collection, we thought it would be a great addition to have. The original prototype that we used. The first one shown in the world. But it's just nowhere to be found, and it's such a great shame that we can't find it. That's right, the original Sonic 1 demo is completely lost. Not even the people who made it can find it, and this interview was from 2011. Surely more efforts had been made to find it since Mega Collection, but it's still lost. Even now, the ROM just doesn't exist anymore, and that is so sad. Naka states that even screenshots of the demo are very rare. Only a few magazines are known to have featured it. There have been many hoaxes of it over the years, but the genuine demo that was so advanced for its time, the one that announced Sonic, is gone. It did inspire the background of Green Hill Zone Act 2 in Sonic Mania, though. There's the possibility that maybe these assets are still in the source code of Sonic 1 over at Sega of Japan. But if they didn't keep a copy of this build, do they even have the source code anymore? They might not. Many source files of older games have been lost over the years, with famous examples even being of other Sega games. It's hard to even imagine a scenario of how this could still be out there. 
Maybe the people behind Tokyo Toy Show have footage of everything ever shown at their events? Sega must have gotten the demo approved before it was showcased at the event. What did they use for that? Video footage? Does that still exist? How many copies of this ROM even existed in the first place? Were there multiple cartridges made of it? Just one? And if someone else does have a copy, why hasn't it been released yet? It's never entirely impossible it'll show up somehow, but the odds are stacked against this one. And yet, just like Sonic 2, every time I see a bootleg copy of Sonic 1 floating around, a part of me wonders, just maybe, it could contain something special. Perhaps not even the demo. Maybe some bootlegger got a hold of a different early build of the game. However, here's another thing. Sonic 2's Simon Y build was only stolen from that toy fair because there was such a huge demand for Sonic at the time. But when this demo was shown off, the series was new. There was excitement for it, but why would anyone try to get an early copy of it? Besides the people involved, no one truly cared about the series until it came out. And as such, there wasn't even much to cover about the game besides, hey, this is Sega's new game. Hopefully it's good. That's probably why there isn't even any video footage of this. It's insanely unlikely this build will ever come to light, but that hope will always be there. Each year, each decade that passes by, the possibility of it being found feels more and more unobtainable. But hey, crazier discoveries have happened in the past. Perhaps one day, dreams will come true. One of the most iconic games of all time naturally has one of the most iconic pre-releases. Of course, I'm talking about Super Mario 64. Considering how revolutionary this game was, we can only imagine how intense its development was. Thankfully, a lot of details about it have come to light. Most famously, Luigi was planned to be a second player controlled character in Mario 64. The planned two player mode was one of the first things implemented too, but unfortunately he didn't make the cut. This sprung decades of speculation as to where Luigi was in Mario 64. In actuality, he's not present anywhere in the data of the final game. But, thanks to the well-known 2020 leak of Nintendo assets, which contained a copy of the game's source code, an official scrapped Luigi model with textures was found. These source files include stuff not included in the final game, which is why Luigi couldn't be found in the final build's files. He simply wasn't compiled as he was unused. But, it is true that he was made for use in the game at one point. What's really shocking is that these leaks came to light in July of 2020, 24 years and one month after the game was released in Japan. In one of the most wonderful, heartwarming twists of all time, L was indeed real 2401. Also found in the source code, it seems the working title of the game was Ultra 64 Mario Brothers. Brothers, huh? Luigi really was meant to once play a really important role in the game. Also thanks to these leaks, we know the game officially entered development on September 7th, 1994. It's been said that Luigi was removed from the game around February of 1996, showing how late he was cut. It makes complete sense that a full model would exist. And it does. And it's beautiful. Unfortunately, these source files are traced to the IQ Chinese version of Mario 64, and as such they're dated 2003. So, we don't have any Mario 64 data prior to IQ's involvement. These early assets are simply leftovers that Nintendo supplied to IQ along with everything else needed for the game. What this means is that despite these leaks having a lot of early assets like levels, enemies, and of course the amazing Luigi model, it doesn't have everything. We still don't have the actual demos and builds of the game as they were shown in pre-release media. Also, I feel I should say this, it's unclear how all of this data leaked. I imagine the methods used weren't exactly legal. While there's a lot of really cool unavoidable stuff like Luigi, for this video, I'd rather focus on official pre-release media from Nintendo themselves. Though, it's awesome this info has been released. At least this shows that Nintendo clearly keeps great backups of their data, unlike some other companies. Back before the days of E3, Nintendo showcased Mario 64 at their own trade show, Shoshinkai 1995. Shoshinkai was an event that ran from 1989 to 1996, before being renamed to Nintendo Space World in 1997. In 2001, Nintendo abandoned their own trade show and started showcasing at E3. But before all of that, Mario 64 and the finalized look of the Nintendo 64 were unveiled at Shoshinkai 95, and there was even a playable demo at the event. Before this event, Nintendo filed some patents in relation to the 64. Included were these very eerie looking screenshots of Peach's Castle, obviously from a very early point of development. Sometimes these early screenshots can honestly look kinda creepy. For the 1995 demo, the game was said to be about 50% complete at this point, and it shows. There's early textures, UI, Peach's castle had a completely different layout at this point, even Mario's voice was different. These clips are actually samples, taken from the Best Service Voice Spectral and the Warner Brothers sound effect libraries. That's why certain lines sound completely different than others. It's likely these were always meant to be placeholders until the final voice clips were finished. 
I absolutely love this early art style of Mario 64. Everything is so vibrant and colorful, you can really see how primitive it is. The Shoshinkai 95 demo of Mario 64 has unfortunately never surfaced, nor have any early builds of the game, meaning footage like this is all we have to go off of. There's a lot of pre-release footage of the game out there, but what else could be hiding in these early versions? There's always this feeling of sadness looking at these long-lost builds of games, knowing you may never get to play them. People care deeply about these games, especially ones like Mario 64. The idea of having access to extra material like early content is incredibly enticing. Obviously, it's irrational to think that any company would release every single piece of content made for their game, but I think there's something to be said in regards to getting these once-public demos re-released. If the company still has access to it, that is. Stuff like the 1995 Mario 64 demo was tested and made ready for public play, and yet if you didn't attend that event, you can't play it. Hopefully that isn't the case forever. As time goes on, demand for these early builds only grows larger. There is so much speculation as to what else could be hiding in here. If what we've seen looks so different, imagine what else could be found. Will we ever find a build of Mario 64 with Luigi still playable? Though, while it would be awesome to see these builds in full someday, it is fun to speculate. Who knows? Perhaps Wario is hiding in the files of this demo. There is no real evidence pointing towards it, but there's just as much pointing against it. Though the genuine demo has yet to surface, fans have come together to modify the game back into what it used to look like. A lot of the footage you may find online is probably from these fan mods and not the real thing, but that shows how accurate they are. It's honestly unbelievable how far Mario 64 modifications have come. The game is understood inside and out. The only thing left for fans to dig through would be early builds of the game. And as unlikely as it may seem, at this point, I'd say just give it time. Nintendo clearly has really deep archives, so perhaps someday, we'll be able to explore these early castle walls. Before Mario 64, Super Mario World also changed radically during development. The game entered development sometime around 1987, and being one of the first Super Nintendo games, production was full of hurdles. What you're seeing is the fabled 1989 build of Super Mario World, which is yet another white whale of game preservation. Many screenshots of it exist, all showing a very different game, but very little of it survives outside of that. The title screen here is completely different, showing a map of a mushroom-shaped island not seen in the final game. The logo is pretty close to the Japanese logo of the game, only being fully blue, similar to the Mario 3 logo. These early screenshots come from magazines that previewed the game well before release. In this magazine, the game is referred to as Super Mario Bros. 4. The overworld shows a better look at that mushroom island, using a completely different layout than seen in the final game. Many of the in-game graphics at this point resemble that of Mario 3. Raccoon Mario and the Super Leaf are even present in some of these screenshots. This power-up isn't in the final game, as it was proudly replaced by Cape Mario. Look at how different Mario looks here, especially small Mario. Thanks to the same Nintendo leaks that gave us that Luigi model, we have these early sprites in full as well as much more from Mario World's development. However, these leaks weren't the first time those early Mario sprites were found. Many early Super Mario World sprites can be found in official Super Nintendo test cartridges, such as the SNES test program as well as the SNSP aging cassette. Curiously, the aging cassette features a seemingly unlicensed version of the Disney song, When You Wish Upon a Star. Sure, this was never a commercially available product and was only ever used for testing purposes, but why did they pick this song? I mean, Fox was sued over a parody of the song appearing in Family Guy, so I'm sure this would have turned some heads if it was public knowledge back when Nintendo was using these programs. But anyway, here's a look at an early sprite sheet from around the time of this build, originating from an official Nintendo interview from 2017 done to promote the Super Nintendo Classic. This is how Yoshi looked at this point of development. And are those… baby Yoshis? If you think that early sprite sheet of Yoshi is weird, some of the even earlier ones, once again from that Nintendo leak, show an even more primitive, reptilian look. It appears the art style of this game once played more into it being on a prehistoric island. While they might look weird, those early Yoshi sprites do look pretty similar to that famous sketch drawn by Miyamoto during the days of the original Super Mario Bros. Pretty cool. Unfortunately, officially at least, the best look we have at the early versions of Super Mario World is press material such as these screenshots, but they're so interesting. And just like Mario 64, a remake of the 1985 build has been made by fans, though it would be incredible to get the real thing. Given how much info has been uncovered over the years though, it's certainly possible.
Now this one is a very interesting story. Action 52 is an unlicensed multi-cart release for the Nintendo Entertainment System in 1991. As the name suggests, it includes 52 games, but they're all of shockingly low quality and the game is regarded as one of the worst gaming items ever released. The games included range from extremely buggy and unfair to unplayable. Its development has always been a bit of a mystery. The game was developed by a company named Active Enterprises, and the head of the company, Vince Perry, stumbled across one of the many illegal multi-carts made back in the NES and Famicom's heyday. This one apparently had 40 games packed onto one cartridge. These multi-carts were pretty common back in the 80s and 90s, and apparently, that cartridge really inspired Perry. And so he had the idea of creating a cartridge just like this one, but with original games, making it, you know, legal. And so, the company began developing Action 52. With a whopping four developers, investors from around the world, and extreme crunch time, the game was thrusted into existence and released without Nintendo's approval. The games included were so bad, there was no way they'd make it past Nintendo's seal of quality. So much for making an official multi-card. Side note, after the game was released, no one's been able to actually find Vince Perry, though people have tried. Action 52 is one of the biggest bombs of the era, so people have tried to find the guy behind it to get more info about its creation. As it turns out, the guy's a complete mystery, and all leads end fruitless. It's honestly kinda creepy, you gotta wonder what happened to the guy. To make this all even more ridiculous, as shown on the box, the suggested retail price was 199 United States dollars. With inflation, that's over $350 today. Plans to make Action 52 the next big thing were underway. The developers really thought this was going to be a huge hit. There was even a Sega Genesis version released in 1993. The flagship title of Action 52 was none other than the Cheetah Men, a side-scrolling game that starred the trio of Cheetah Men, who Active seriously hoped would become the next TMNT. They prepared toys, comics, and more, all based off of this really bad game. Unfortunately, these guys wouldn't even be contenders for the next Street Sharks, and the game was a huge failure. But it did get an official animated commercial that aired on TV. I say to you, chap, shouldn't you go on a diet? Are you talking to me? Hmm, maybe if these guys would make these holes bigger, I could fit easy, you know what I'm saying? Hey, man, I'll help you out. No worries, no. Action 52 is an absolutely crazy tale on its own, but there's more to its legacy than just the initial release. Before the game had proven itself to be a colossal failure, development on a Cheetah Men 2 sequel had begun. The game was cancelled and was never released, but in 1996, a warehouse full of copies of the game was found. It's believed that 1,500 copies of the game were produced. Who knows how many still exist today, though? These cartridges were actually repurposed, likely unsold copies of Action 52. The two games are identical, apart from Cheetah Men 2 having this small golden label. Since the game was very unfinished, it's unknown why these cartridges were produced, but given the low amount made and the absolutely crazy story behind them, they've become extremely rare collector's items. Copies of Action 52 are already hard to find, but this one truly makes for a collection centerpiece, as weird as it is. But neither of these games are as hard to find as the man behind it all. But maybe this is one mystery best left to rest. You've surely heard of prototypes of unreleased games, but how about prototypes of unreleased versions of games? In the mid-90s, a bootleg Sega Genesis Street Fighter 2 cartridge began showing up in various international markets. While Capcom released their own official port for the system in the form of Street Fighter 2 Special Champion Edition, this bootleg version was unique. This so-called Turbo Bootleg is a shockingly good port of Street Fighter 2 Champion Edition. So what was going on here? How was this fake version so good and not just another World Heroes 2? Well, here's what happened. Capcom Street Fighter II The World Warrior ranks among the most ported games of all time, and following its incredibly successful 1991 arcade release, fans were eager to play the game at home. Given their history, Nintendo and Capcom were very close when Street Fighter became huge, so a Super Nintendo port was swiftly made and released worldwide across 1992. Nintendo even made an exclusivity deal with Capcom, meaning the game couldn't be released anywhere but the Super Nintendo. This port was developed by Capcom in-house and is of very good quality. It would go on to sell 6.3 million units, making it one of the Super Nintendo's most popular games. But following its home console debut, fans wondered if Sega would be getting any Street Fighter love of their own. Despite Nintendo and Capcom's deal, around the summer of 1992, Sega were able to work out their own deal. See, in March of 1992, Capcom released Street Fighter II Champion Edition. Technically, this was a different arcade release, making it a different game, allowing for a Sega port to be created. At the time, Capcom was unfamiliar with Sega's hardware, so the port was outsourced to a third-party company, much like their other Sega releases. 
After the deal was made, the two companies were very secretive in regards to Street Fighter II coming to the Genesis. Rumors were flying about a port being far in development, releasing soon in 1992, even some rumors of a Sega CD port being made appeared as well. But the game wouldn't be officially announced until March 10th, 1993, when Sega of America and Capcom USA held a press conference, officially announcing their partnership. There, they announced that Street Fighter II Champion Edition would be released for the Sega Genesis in June of 1993, alongside a new six-button controller, perfect for fighting games. Prototypes of the Genesis port were available at the press conference, showing the game was already pretty far in development. Journalists at the event praised the port, and magazines reported it was already close to 80% complete and was of great quality, despite a few faults such as these black bars that show at the top of gameplay, which weren't present in the Super Nintendo version. However, also in 1993, Capcom announced Street Fighter II Turbo Hyper Fighting, another revision beyond Champion Edition, which was already set for a release on the Super Nintendo. This version was set to release in July of 1993, shortly after Sega's now inferior version was set to come out. Turbo was to include all the bonuses of Champion Edition, along with faster gameplay which became highly requested after the circulation of Street Fighter II Rainbow Edition, a boot-like modification of the original arcade release which became popular thanks to its faster speed and crazy new moves. That's a completely different story though. Point is, Nintendo was already going to get another better version, so Sega had some catching up to do. To make things way worse, shortly after it was publicly announced, Capcom of Japan weren't very happy with how this outsourced port for the Genesis was coming out. Capcom USA were willing to polish up this version and get it released, but Capcom of Japan decided to pull the plug on it, restart, and make it themselves, leading to Street Fighter II Special Champion Edition, a version of Champion Edition with features similar to Turbo, which was released for the Sega Mega Drive and Genesis in 1993. This was a mess. Sega were eager to get a port of one of the hottest games in the world, but even after securing a port, Capcom announces an even better version being made for Nintendo's system, and they also scrapped all the work that had been done on the Genesis port to that point. Though it was delayed, Special Champion Edition released in September of 1993 and was a decent success, but the mystery regarding that original port continued. Before being cancelled, the original port had a considerable amount of work done on it, so much so that as mentioned magazines already began promoting it and even reviewing it, showing lots of screenshots and details from this version of the game. Some magazines even confused it for the new Special Champion Edition. There was promotional video footage of it that was released, there was even box art made for it too, all for it to just never come out. But, while it was never officially released, on June 2nd, 1994, a curious Street Fighter II Mega Drive ROM appeared online, supplied by the ROM dumper group The Boss. This case appears to be very similar to how the Simon Y Sonic 2 build came to circulation, through a pirated cartridge. Here's a look at the title screen, clearly showing its bootleg origin, but the rest of the game was surprisingly faithful. This bootleg of Street Fighter II Turbo was a mystery for years. How was it so good? It seemed totally original, not being a hack of any other existing fighting game for the system. Of course, this is because this is a modified version of that cancelled Champion Edition. For years, whether or not this bootleg had ties to that cancelled version was debated. Why was the title screen different? There are differences between the magazine screenshots and this bootleg. It must just be a really accurate fake. Yes, this bootleg isn't identical to the one shown in early promo material. Those black bars are nowhere to be seen, but it's very similar. It's almost certain that this bootleg comes from that port's latest point of development, before Capcom of Japan stepped in and decided to do it themselves. The graphics and many gameplay features line up very closely with the original advertised version. However, their connection wouldn't be conclusively confirmed until much later, when two prototypes of the original version were found and dumped by the people at Hidden Palace. Included with those ROMs is an incredible write-up detailing this version of the game, as well as solid proof that the Turbo bootleg is connected to this version. It'll likely always remain a mystery as to how that bootleg copy came into circulation, and even with the genuine prototypes now being available, we'll probably never know for sure. But this goes to show that you never know where a prototype could show up. Sometimes, the games you least expect have the most interesting development. Would you believe me if I told you that SpongeBob SquarePants Super Sponge is one of the most chronicled games out there? Despite being a pretty unremarkable licensed game, it has a shocking amount of documentation available online, due to files from the entire development cycle being leaked. The company that developed this game, Climax Studios, closed some of its branches in 2008, and the assets from those branches were sold off. Included were these two backup discs, which included, oh you know, every single asset ever made for Super Sponge. These discs have since been posted online, and include everything ever made related to the game. Even actual show assets sent by Nickelodeon as references to the game's developers were all found. Of course, there were also many prototype builds. This goes for both the PlayStation and Game Boy Advance versions of the game. 
We'll start with the PlayStation game's intro. In the earliest build of the game, the intro is just the show's actual intro. The one from the June 2001 build gets cut off early, but features different clips from the show. The July build's intro is definitely the best, featuring funky title cards and misspelled character names. SpongeBob's name is misspelled, and Mr. Krabs is referred to as Krusty Krab. This was all cleaned up for the final release's intro. Early builds of the PlayStation version feature 3D models for most of the characters. I can't imagine why they would change these. The voice acting also wasn't done at this point, so some early builds have placeholder audio instead. It's my best friend Patrick's birthday, and a signed photo of his favorite superheroes would be the best thing ever. It's my best friend Patrick's birthday, and a signed photo of his favorite superheroes would be the best thing ever. Other things of interest in these early builds include sketches used for placeholder art, unused levels, and characters that were cut from the game. The game's source code features assets from the show, including backgrounds and episode scripts. There are also these character model sheets. It's crazy to think all of this came from Super Sponge. Literally anything ever used in relation to this game is backed up online. However, fair warning. Contained in these source files are some shockingly inappropriate pieces of artwork, as well as files titled by someone with a real sailor's mouth. It's pretty clear that some of the people at Climax weren't totally on board with making this game. Their name's pretty fitting, though. The Game Boy Advance version's early builds are also quite interesting. What you're looking at is a build dated November 28th, 2000. It looks nothing like the final game, but also looks pretty impressive for being such an early GBA project. For reference, this is what the final game looked like. Check out this one that tests some wacky graphical effects. This one's from January 8th, 2001. Apart from the many builds and concept art, there are also some documents that detail how the team wanted the game to play, some that directly reference other games like Yoshi's Island. There's even one titled Spongebob Sh list that details everything wrong with the game that needs fixing. The files also contain emulators and ROMs of these games, in case the team needed to reference them while developing. So yeah, if you're interested in prototypes, I absolutely recommend checking out what's available for Spongebob Super Sponge. <laughs> there is some wild stuff. And there you have it, a look at various mind-boggling video game prototypes and early builds. Whether they're totally lost or extensively archived, these game prototypes will always be some of the most interesting things to me. It's like we never know what'll be archived next. It's so great that even decades out of a game's release, you never know when or how new info about the game will come out. We're honestly very lucky for this. It's hard enough preserving some released games. Preserving their early content is a completely different story, but it's important. It's what keeps the preservationist hobby alive. That hope that one day you'll unearth the next big find. This content gives each game even more to discuss beyond the game itself, and it gives great insight into game development as a whole. Just look at how some of these games changed over time. This is very inspiring stuff to those who want to get into the industry someday. But as great as it is, it's so defeating when you've seen screenshots of some of these for years, well, decades for some of them, but know it's incredibly unlikely you'll ever get to experience them. One day, we'll find that Tokyo Toy Show demo of Sonic 1. There's no way it's actually gone forever. It must be out there somewhere. This goes for more recent games too. Even though early builds for them aren't as common, I still hope that someday we'll be able to preserve stuff like the E3 2006 demo of Super Mario Galaxy. From the Mega Man X White City build, to the early versions of Super Smash Bros, to so, 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 so much more. The mystery of game prototypes will live on forever. It's impossible to save everything, but we can hope that game developers are taking the measures needed to archive these important pieces of gaming history.